Hi, everybody. It's Stacy Sobel with Salon Today Conversations. And today I have Mr. Jim Valenzuela, also known as Mr. V, and Emily Brown from V's Barbershop. Hi, Jim. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. And Emily? Doing good. How are you? Good. And you guys are um, kind of the picture of work from home because you're in different states, correct? We are. Uh, I'm here in Phoenix, and uh, Emily is in a small town in Colorado uh, with much better weather than we have here in Phoenix. <laughs> and terrible internet, so I apologize if I get choppy. Well, you may freeze up on us. We'll just find out, right? That, that happens on some of these. Um, I just read an article from the LA Times about a man who drove 600 miles for a haircut. And um, which I know that I desperately want hair color and, color and a haircut, but I don't know that I'm quite that desperate. You guys have a real insight into men. And we did talk about this. Emily was on our first webinar. If you've been listening to the salon today webinar, it's talking about how men feel about their barbershop versus women's salons. Talk a little bit about that relationship. Well, it's a strong one. Um, one of the things we noticed uh, back when we opened up in 99 and with a little bit of background, uh, I didn't have a minute's worth of uh, experience in the barbershop business. So one of the real theories uh, that held true that was illuminated quickly was uh, guys were loyal to their barbers, uh, almost on par with, with any other relationship they have in their lives, uh, whether that be a dentist or a mechanic or a doc. Uh, man, their barber is central to them. And uh, it was really kind of cool to watch. Um, Guys driving, you said a guy drove 600 miles. Hell, we've had stories of guys flying in for haircuts from other cities and say, you know, I'm stopping by V's. I come once a month to Phoenix. This is when we first opened and I uh, won't get my haircut anywhere else. And uh, didn't see that coming, but uh, certainly the relationship between guys and their barbers is, uh, is profound. It's cool to watch. I'd say it's also not always about the haircut. Um, it's, it's about the relationship and the experience and a place that people feel very comfortable, like they belong, like it's like the cheers effect. So there's a bit of that belonging as well. Yeah. It's their place. And I think there's nothing like a pandemic to kind of illustrate that relationship and how important it is. What you've got some, you're in multiple states. You're how many locations and how many states? We have 47 uh, open stores, uh, a bunch under development right now. And that constitutes uh, 16, 17 states, something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot for you all to manage as you're looking at, you know, every state has different guidelines and you've got to look at the protocols. And I know that you, they're franchises, but you guys are coaching and leading those franchisees in the reopening process. So that's got to be a lot to track. Boy, uh, it was, uh, it was a, you know, a cold uh, splash of water when it first happened, trying to wrap our arms around it. Did a lot of reading, a lot of online time trying to figure this out. I mean, it was a mystery to all of us. Uh, never have uh, we had a situation where all the businesses closed at once. And we've never had a, a situation where a couple of them closed at once. And so this was a whole new ball game for us. Uh, you know, I'd always... As an entrepreneur, I always dreaded the day or or, or, or was scared of the day I'd walk into uh, V's and there'd be no business. And uh, I walked into uh, a V's back in March and there was no business for 47 stores. And so it was a stark reality. Um, we had our hands full. Uh, we decided to amp up our communications to the franchise community in a pretty big way. Um, we wanted to get them the information that we were seeing and, it's, and it was shifting on us. Um, and, and it still is, you know, every state's different. Uh, we can't, uh, we don't know what the reopening rules will be. Um, and so we have to be pretty light on our feet to deal with it. So you talk about um, right now is a time to survive now to thrive later. Um, talk a little bit about when you talk to your franchisees, what does that mean? Well, I, you know, I think the, the inclination coming out uh, or when you reopen, uh, was to just try to grab as much business as you can because uh, you've been out of business for, for 35, 40 days and uh, you wanted to get back to, to cutting hair and giving shaves as fast as possible. But it's a bit short-sighted. Uh, our, our focus was not only to start making money again, but um, how to position the business so that the consumer, the patron, saw that we took this seriously. And uh, we'll take it seriously for, for now 
uh, going forward. Uh, I told our group, our franchise community, um, we've got the rarest of things. We've got a uh, second chance at a first impression. And uh, that exactly what the, what the pandemic afforded us. And so we doubled down on sanitation, uh, not to say that we were lacking in any way before, but this changed the paradigm. Um, it became the, the focus of uh, job one of how we introduce these back to our patrons. And that is sanitation based, we're clean, or our, our, our tagline is licensed, clean and pristine, and we mean it. Uh, if we didn't and just opened up, like there's so many other barbershops just opening up and walk in without any precautions or, or, or the barber's just taking it uh, you know, nonchalantly, uh, that's just not good for us or the industry. So um, it was a, it's a new, new day and, and we know now that every day forward, it's gonna be uh, sanitation and cleanliness and uh, taking care of our patrons and our staffs it's job one. Um, you know, we're, we're dedicated to giving great haircuts, but we, we don't want anybody to get sick uh, uh, because no matter how good a haircut you get, it doesn't look that good in the hospital. So um, we, we, we're serious about it. Yeah. So licensed, clean, and pristine, was that a tagline you had before this happened or is that something you guys developed? No, um, I'll give you a glimpse on how we operate. So Emily, Chris, and I, and Renee, we have just some core corporate staff, we're on a phone call trying to, you know, how do we position this now? What's the brand branding on, on reopening? And just off the top of my head, I just said, licensed, clean, and pristine. And Emily, as she normally does, says, that's it. And so yeah, that became the, the tagline, and uh, we happen to like it. And the, the first uh, word in that license was really important to me because in the barbershop space, there's so many unlicensed people. And uh, this is not the time to be unlicensed. Um, you know, you, you, you need to play by the rules. You need to take the sanitation uh, seriously. Uh, the country spent trillions of dollars to try to prop up the economy. And if you're not licensed and you're cheating on your taxes, um, I think the public should know about that because I think there's an element of trust when you are licensed and there should be some mistrust that you're not licensed for some reason. Well, and I've I been saying that a little bit for a while, that there's never been a better time to educate the public about what the, the license means. Um, because I don't know that clients give it that much thought in a typical world, but they certainly are now. So Absolutely. I think the, yeah. the ability to talk about the license and what that entails and what people have to know to get it is really important. Yeah, I mean, licensure over the last couple of years is becoming more and more deregulated. And this might focus the argument on the need to, to keep regulation in place. You know, where every barbershop and salon is by design um, is close proximity. And this virus is, uh, that's its hallmark, close proximity. You gotta be close to somebody uh, to be able to get it. So um, I think sanitation, and certainly uh, the bedrock of these from day one was a different experience because barbershops were just these dregs before V's came along. They were dirty, they were unkept, uh, they, they had lost all their nostalgic equity. They were, they were not good places. And so to have regulation to, um, to prop them up as, as the, the central focus, I think is good. I, I think it benefits the whole industry. Emily, did you have something to add? The, the licensure not only goes towards the shop. Um, I think a lot of people don't understand that the shops are licensed and graded and most of those inspections or grades are posted so that the public can see in most uh, states that's required. But also each individual barber and the license that they hold and the safety sanitation training that they go through adds on top of the licensure of the actual shop. So we're, it's, it's you know licensure to the nth degree, which is exactly what people um, should feel some comfort in. But we, again, need to talk about it um, and I think talk about the uh, regulation of that and you know some states are much stricter than others and we've tended as a brand to hold the highest standards as far as license or licensing licensing goes um, and kind of share those uh, best practices across the board and that's one thing that we were able to do through the licensed clean and pristine through the prep work the development of store opening checklist type documents um, and and really doing some training on the inside prior to openings as well um, and I wanted to go back real quick on your first comment and just add uh, another item that we really did spend some time on throughout this process that I'm still spending time on um, as a member of the board of directors for um, ISBN 
it really greatly benefited us as a brand as well to be part of an organization where many others were sharing resources, sharing their own best practices, sharing their own insight into what individual states were doing. So we have shops in 16, 17 states, um, but you know, Great Clips is in all 50 states and international. So being able to kind of converse with some of those ISBN members and um, find out what they were doing or what struggles they were having, um, whether it be in the closure or the reopening was also hugely beneficial to us um, and proved to be um, very well worth our time and effort. So uh, the, the thread of ISBN has really come through um, to hold this industry together. Um, and it's been really um, heartwarming to watch that as, as some of these businesses go back through reopening, especially in a time where there are gonna be a lot of barbershops and salons that really suffer greatly due to the, to the pandemic. Well, one of the things you guys talked about is the importance of leadership at this time and that that meant um, Jim in particular needed to take a bigger, bigger role in the communication process. Um, how was that kind of developed? Well, you know, developed from common sense. Um, we know everybody was nervous because we were nervous. And so they needed to hear from us that uh, we're on top of it. Uh, we understand uh, how it's affecting us and what the response plan needs to be. Um, and so to be able to, to get more aggressive in communicating with our people uh, just was, was easy to do. It was common sense. It was not the time to go hide in the bunker. It was a time to get proactive and say, you know, have you looked at these resources? Have you contemplated this? Uh, all the while, we were telling our, our troops, uh, we're going to reopen. The trick's going to get uh, be getting to the other side of the pandemic because there's going to be this huge pent-up demand for what we do. And so um, we, we, we gave them the resources. We talked about the, the uh, challenges ahead, but also gave them some optimism because I think you need that in any business that uh, we're going to make it. And uh, if you just get to the other end, um, then uh, we're, we're going to be fine. And, and that's held true. You know, the stores that we've reopened are, are abnormally busy uh, with no uh, let up uh, so far. Uh, certainly out in Ar here in Arizona, we've been open for a couple of weeks and the stores are slammed. Fun to watch, but a challenge given social distancing and, and, and the other dictates that we face. Mm -hmm. Now we talked a little bit about the importance of the relationship between the male customer and the barber, but you, um, as a family barbershop, also have a very important relationship with moms and dads and their kids, because you do a lot of, of, of young boys. So yeah, we talk do. about the importance of that relationship. And of course, parents are going to have an even more heightened sense of responsibility for choosing the location that's safe for the, for the children to get a haircut. Sure. And that's been, you know, honestly, that was been a, been a focus for the last 21 years for these. Uh, candidly, my favorite customers are kids. Uh, I've got four of them. It was a pleasure to see the kids in the shop. Uh, big smiles, lollipop in their mouth. Uh, you know, kids would come to these and, and it was uh, Halloween for them because we always have candy out for them. Um, and we noticed that, you know, if, if you take good care of the, of the little ones, then uh, they're they're almost a little annuity for the next 10, 15 years. You get them back in the, in the chair once a month. Um, but you, 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 know, you have to pay attention to that. You have to keep the place clean. Uh, there's no bigger critic in our industry than a mom who brings her kid into a shop. Uh, she'll notice if it's dirty. She'll notice if it's unkempt. She'll notice the bathroom. And you know, uh, I've always said that you make a mom happy, she'll tell 10 of her friends. If you make a mom unhappy, she'll tell 100 of her friends. And so, you know, kids are just, uh, they're a focus for us. Uh, not every barber loves to give kids haircuts. They're priced lower and their, their heads are, you know, equally as big. And so and it takes just as much time, but it's the future of the business. And so keeping uh, the place appropriate for kids is important to our long-term future. It is our long-term future. And uh, that, that hits on every aspect of the business, cleanliness and friendliness uh, patience, quality, experience, everything that wraps up into our business can really be, be distilled down to how did we treat the kid? Because that's, the, that's how important it is for the longevity of our business. And we've had to make some tough changes. We had to take the, the Tootsie Pops out of the shop, you know, for, for now. Um, we had to take the books out of the stores that were there for the little kids. 
um, you know, it's, this is a scary time. I have children myself. It's a scary time for kids. And I think that, you know, the normal uh, repetitive uh, habit of, okay, it's time to go get your hair cut has been something that um, a lot of families looked forward to and were grateful for. Um, we've had a lot, we've probably had more customer um, commentary over the last couple of weeks reopening than um, any other average time in our in our lifespan. And for the for the most part, it's all been ridiculously tremendous, um, comical and funny at times. Um, and some of it is coming from those moms that say, thanks, you made me feel safe, you know, so they're really more worried about safety than the lollipop. Hopefully the lollipops will come back because we know that the kids, that's what the kids want. They want right. SpongeBob on the TV. They want to sit in the same chair that dad got to sit in and they want to get their lollipop at the end, but they have trust, trust and faith in the brand and in us and their barber and their community shop that they come back. So as long as we just keep hitting those marks and keep those moms feeling comfortable and dads feeling comfortable, the kids follow. Um, but hitting those marks is is key. We can't, we cannot slack. We cannot let anything slack. You do have a distinct advantage in that the barbershop stations are built with sinks right at the station. So um, hand washing, and it makes the hand washing for both the technician or the client, if you allow them to do it there, a lot easier. Yeah, that's just serendipity. Uh, when we designed the first shop, um, I thought an authentic barbershop had a sink to wash your hair behind the barber. I didn't want guys, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable walking through a crowded barbershop with a towel over my head, you know, kind of a walk of shame. So it's, uh, <laughs> we put them behind the, the chair. Uh, every shop has that feature. Um, yeah, and it just came back to, to be a, a good addition of the barbershop. It's, you know, uh, more expensive to build out uh, because of plumbing. But, you know, looking back, it was the right move. And certainly over the last two months, it, uh, it, you know, it absolutely was the right move. You, you guys also shared some really nice comments that you have gotten from your clients. Um, like, thank God Spies is back. And I went from hippie to respectable citizen in, in one sitting. Some, some really clever, fun things, but some meaningful ones too. But I, I was welcomed with open arms, treated like a human being, and I almost cried. Yeah, it's just, it's heartwarming. Uh, one of the things that we do is we get a ton of feedback from our patrons by design. We want it. Not all good. You know, every once in a while, we'll get one that just bangs on, on us. And, and uh, but, you know, the vast majority are just tremendous. Uh, we read every single one of them. Um, there's, uh, I don't know, there's been hundreds of thousands of them over the years. And uh, they mean something to us. And so if they've got something nice to say about the barbershop, great. And they got something bad to say about the barbershop, we probably want to hear about it even more. And there's been a couple, um, you know, quite candidly, the, uh, the rush back to the business has presented some of the shops just to be really busy. Yeah. There's a lot of muscle memory in this industry and it's hard to break habits, but you have to break them because you have to follow the new rules. And these are rules that were just instituted. So it's tough to, to break that. Uh, we, as soon as we get a, 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 a review that bangs on us, We'll contact the shop and say, you just can't do that. Sorry, game's changed. And, and that's also where Jim's stepping in and doing these um, reminder system-wide um, type calls to say, okay, we're going to come together and we're going to talk about here's some of the great that we've heard. Here's some of the alarming that we've heard. Um, and, and it's an, in an effort to break that traditional muscle memory and just give them the insight that we have um, because they're not all seeing those um, that commentary come through and realizing that the the greatest need out of any single barbershop um, is to allow the people that are in it to feel safe according to their standards their own because it's perception and even though we're following the mandates and doing what we need to do um, it's really about does the patron feel safe so jim is is the voice of reminding everybody in our system not to forget to do this, not to forget to do that, and here's why. And and just, you know, this all comes back to them in terms of longevity. If we do the right thing now, today, and we take all these extra steps and precautions, and, you know, as franchise owners, spend the money, there's plenty of money that's going into all of these, these um, 
uh, personal protective equipment type supplies, PPE supplies, everybody hears PPE and they just think it's, you know, magically showing up. It's expensive. Um, and we're doing that in an effort to do the right thing because in another year or two or however long this takes, we're hopeful that people remember that. Yeah, the one thing we didn't do, Stacy, is add on any fees uh, to cover the PPE. Um, I had a number of owners call me, uh, say it'd be a good time for a price increase. Uh, I, I need to cover the fees on the PPE and that, we resisted that. Um, and, and we did it because um, I, we all went to the supermarket and the toilet paper was gone, right? And people were hoarding. And I think people took advantage of the situation and we were determined not to do that. We're, we're gonna come back as we were before, a bit different, but we're gonna be the same value we were before. That leads to higher costs that we have to absorb and raise prices down the road. Well, we'll get to that point not coming out of a pandemic where people have been out of work, worried about the future, moms are frazzled because they're homeschooling, I mean, the world changed. And maybe one of the constants could be, I could go back to these almost like it was before, a bit different, but almost. And we, we plan to do it. I, I don't know if you've been to a restaurant lately, they're open out here in Arizona. That experience has changed. They're about a quarter full. And so being in that environment is a different, uh, is a different reality. We're you know, kind of dedicated to making these the same reality they had before with a whole lot more hand washing. Mm -hmm. well, I we, think we that's why I... open restaurants, so you're, you're a little ahead of us on that, but I think you have a distinct advantage in the fact that you have locations in so many different states. You can learn from the ones that opened early and, and yeah. relay that information across the network. Yeah, and, and that's what we're doing. We have a call scheduled with the family, the DeVee's family tomorrow to share some of that and to uh, say these are best practices, this is working, this isn't working, and also to you know, try to temper some of the uh, enthusiasm at the owner uh, level to say it's just not all about taking the money right now. And there's a lot coming through the register. You gotta, we gotta position ourselves long-term and let the patrons know they, that we did our best for them and that will translate out into long-term viability and uh, growth. And I don't know about you guys, but just as being you know, just a normal consumer, even going to the grocery store um, in Colorado, restaurants are not open. Um, but I have found that just personally, and I think that we've reflected this with V's, right now, a little bit of kindness goes a long way. It really matters, you know, like with the face masks, people don't see people smile anymore. You can't see the bottom part of their face. So you have to actually speak and be kind and say, you know, yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and thank you, and welcome. And I think that, you know, putting that little tidbit of kindness into our, um, our family and our brand and really encouraging that to, to kind of blossom and go even further, you know, it makes people feel good right now because people are scared. And it's a weird time and it's weird, like I said, for kids, it's weird for adults too. And they're looking for a sense of and, and a part of or a piece of normalcy that they had prior to this and getting that personal service is part of that. So kindness matters more than anything right now. Anxiety of team members to come back. Have you experienced any of that? And, and has some of the, the great reviews and feedback from the customers helped helped any uh, barbers that were anxious about coming back to work? Yeah, I mean, it, we, we certainly had uh, some barbers that were trepid to come back, um, and rightfully so. I mean, that was a personal decision on their part. Uh, we had some barbers that were, uh, you know, financially motivated to keep unemployment rolling. Uh, you know, the, the government's relief efforts uh, uh, kind of, uh, played a game on all of us. Uh, you know, they, some of these people are making more money at home, uh, not working than they are working, but that's coming to an end and, uh, and they'll, they'll have to go back to work. But, you know, every owner uh, is the owner of a small business and uh, they have to go and, and convince their staff, these are the efforts we've made and the steps we've taken, to try to keep you safe. And um, they also have told their staffs that these people are starved for services and they're probably going to be very happy that you provided them and show that gratitude in the form of a bigger tip. And that acted as a, a good draw. And, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the tips have been phenomenal uh, in, in, uh, in thanking them from cut, cutting their hair. And it's, it's kind of odd that, you know, getting your hair cut became such a big thing to so many guys. You know, you would think that 
is that essential? Can you go through life without getting your haircut? Yeah, but you know, there was a ton of guys that were just affected by it. Thank God, right? Uh, that's the business that we're in. Almost like uh, to the point, losing sports and not getting a haircut became almost on par with each other. Like, why, why is this thing messing with me and the two things I really like to do? So <laughs> it was, uh, you, you know, it's, it's fun to see the staffs back at work. I, I think that they're happy they're back. I think that their hands are happy they're back. They're, they're getting the workout that they needed that they missed for a month and a half. But um, you know, certainly there's been a couple that uh, are waiting this thing out. Um, but I think they'll come back. And I also think uh, as part of this is uh, the labor pool, at least in our part of the industry, will probably grow a little bit. Um, there's going to be some failures because of the, the pandemic. And, and hopefully they'll find a home at V's and, and uh, put some value in all the things that we go through to try to keep them safe and financially okay. Yeah, I think that's really important. Well, I have a husband who desperately needs a haircut and um, I haven't even seen, my, my son's in California, so I haven't seen him for, for a while, but I can't imagine how bad it is. <laughs> well, you should have seen my hair before I got a cut. I mean, if I couldn't get a haircut, we know we got a problem. So they're, they're, they're in good company. Well, thank you both. This has been an excellent conversation and I appreciate you coming on and thanks so, thanks so much for um, sharing your wisdom with us. Our pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day.